Yeah, here we go. So the reason why we think there might be a protective effect against autism operating in females is because so many fewer females are diagnosed with autism than males are. And that's shown in these plots of prevalence. The rate of diagnosis in males is shown in blue and females in red. And this is an incredibly striking difference that is remarkably consistent across time, as shown on the left, and across space or locations, as shown on the right. And each of these differences shake out to about a four to one male to female ratio. Approximately four times as many males are diagnosed with autism as females are. Now, why is this the case? There are a few major possibilities that could be contributing. One is systematic that the systems in place in our society for getting individuals diagnosed are less adept at recognizing what autism looks like in females, and therefore females might slip through the cracks of this diagnostic process. Another possibility is societal, that gendered social pressures teach women and girls, whether implicitly or explicitly, to hide their autism symptoms, to camouflage them. And to the extent that that camouflaging is successful, these individuals might evade diagnosis and go undiagnosed for some time. And a third possibility is biological, that there are biological differences between human males and females that influence susceptibility for autism. And it's in this domain that we think a female protective effect may be operating. In other words, a biological phenomenon that is either uniquely present in females or at least more frequent or more robust in females compared to males that acts to protect, protect them against autism. Now really, each of these possibilities is not mutually exclusive with the others. All are likely to be contributing to, in some way to that four to one skew that we see in the diagnostic rate. But as a neurogeneticist, what I feel is my potential contribution to this space is to give us a better understanding of the biological piece of that pie. Now, by focusing on biology, I'm in no way implying that understanding systematic biases to diagnosis or gendered social pressures and camouflaging is any less important. Um, it's just the area in which I have the skills and expertise to contribute. And one of the cool things about understanding biology is that every piece of this biological puzzle that we learn about opens the door for developing a medical intervention in this space. And by intervention, I don't just mean cures or full prevention, but the development of any therapeutic or medical tool that could be useful for managing symptoms or improving quality of life. Now, to get to a place where we have a detailed understanding of the biological con contribution to a female protective effect, we need, I mean, we need a few things. One is that we need a thorough understanding of the differences between the autistic and non-autistic brain. This area of research has been really the focus of autism characterization research throughout autism's history. And so we're well on our way to understanding what these differences are, um, but we'll continue to work in this space in more um, detailed and new avenues of biology. Another aspect of biology that we definitely need to know more about are the sex differences to, uh, present in the human neurotypical brain. How do, what are the biological processes that are more pronounced in females as compared to males? And what shows really no difference between the sexes at all? Now, um, making any sorts of claims in this space about absolute differences between males and females and their overall cognitive ability or cognitive potential um, are, are irresponsible and unfounded by data. But it is not outrageous to acknowledge that there are differences between males and females in our basic biology. Um, and it, it, it serves us to understand what those differences are and how they interact with risk for disease um, and other medical conditions. So one example um, of a relatively uncontroversial um, sex difference in biology, just to, to wet ourselves of this idea, is that there are basic differences in male and female anatomy. Um, most obviously, when we think about the structure of reproductive organs, these differ between males and females, although even this is not a perfect binary across the population. Another example are differences in height. Though there's a great deal of overlap in the distribution of male and female human height, the average male is consistently and significantly taller than the average female. I think we can all agree. Some other areas, um, the likelihood you are to experience balding as you age, the likelihood that you're going to be diagnosed with breast cancer, even the way in which an individual will, might experience the symptoms of a heart attack. These are all differences between male and female biology that we have more or less accepted and taken it as biological fact. Now, um, the human brain 
Well, a very special organ is an organ in our body just like any other organ. And this organ is exposed to the same biological factors that drive those anatomical differences that I just mentioned. By that, I mean genes from the X and Y chromosome and exposure to sex steroid hormones like estrogens and testosterone. And so it's a reasonable hypothesis to make that there may be sex differences in the human brain as well. And this is just one example of such a sex difference. This comes from a structural imaging study of nearly 1,200 individuals from ages 8 to 23. And this study looked at, among other things, um, gray matter. So that's the cell bodies of cells in our brain, not the connections between them. And they found that males have greater gray matter volume and mass than females, whereas females have greater gray matter density than males do. So. Um, this is just one example of a sex difference that exists, but we don't really understand what sex differences like this in the brain mean fully for uh, their interaction with risk for disease or risk for biology for conditions like autism. And to be able to figure that out, we need to add those individuals with those conditions into our studies to, incur to um, look at sex and our trait of interest in the same context. So what we really want to find now are where sex differences and autism differences intersect. We want to find the biological phenomena that fit in these quadrants. Now, to do this successfully, what we really need to do is make sure that our studies include both males and females with and without autism to be able to uh, sort our observations out into these categories. Now, this sounds straightforward enough, but it hasn't historically been the uh, method that we, that we would use. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So historically, in autism, uh, much of the work that has described what autism looks like has used populations of exclusively or primarily males. So this leaves us with a bit of a blind spot about what autism looks like in females. More recently, and rightfully so, there's been a push to fill that blind spot by characterizing what female autism looks like, typically by comparing autistic females to autistic males. And this is a good direction to go in, but it still leaves us with another blind spot, which is how do autistic females differ from or look similar to non-autistic females? And if we put this all together, um, we see that our biggest blind spot is in understanding what makes non-autistic females special compared to these other populations, which is really a shame because this is the population where these protective effects are most likely to be operating. And it's the reason why projects like the Autism Sisters Project um, are so important. So as we design these studies that include comparisons of sex and comparison of autism and controls, what we're really looking for when we talk about protection or risk are the following. So we want to find biological phenomena and I'm that, using that term vaguely, intentionally, it could be anything, cells, circuits, pathways, brain regions, functions, and so on. We want to find phenomena um, that are involved in protection. So these would be phenomena that are more prevalent or more robust in females than males, and either absent or reduced in autism. In other words, increased or present in controls. If we're looking for risk factors, then those would be factors that are more prevalent in males compared with females. Um, and either uniquely present in autism or increased in autism. Um, but to do this, we do need to inc include males and females and those with and without autism. So in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to share with you two examples of studies that have used this paradigm, included the dimensions of sex and autism, and, and show you some of the headway that they've been able to make in um, learning about what the biology is that might be responsible for protection or risk. So this first example is a study of gene expression, which is a measure of the relative abundance of RNA molecules in donor brain tissue along these two axes of interest. So sex on the x-axis, autism versus control on the y. Every point is a gene, and the shape of each point corresponds to the type of cell in the brain where that gene carries out its major function. And what this result showed us is that Genes that are involved in the functions of astrocytes, which is a non-neuronal cell type in the brain um, that helps to keep the brain functioning properly, these genes are expressed at a higher level in autism compared with controls and in males compared with females. If we think about the schematic that I just showed, this suggests that this type of cell, this astrocyte, may be involved in male risk mechanisms for autism. A second example is a study that looked at 
um, images of human brains, so structural images. And in this particular case, they were looking at cortical thickness, so the thickness of the outermost layer of the brain. And not just one measure of the brain, but the measure of thickness across many different regions of the cortex. And they combined those measures into one to develop a predictive model of just how female-like or male-like the brain in front of them looked according to their neuroanatomy. Um, and it's a bit complex, but that, that probability of how male-like or female-like the anatomy looked is what's shown on the x-axis here. So in controls, um, you can see that these distributions of male and female neuroanatomy do overlap, but they are clearly shifted and different from each other. Whereas among autistic participants in this study, these distributions are nearly indistinguishable. Um, and, and if anything, look a bit more like a neurotypical male than a neurotypical female. So uh, this type of pattern, this observation, would not have been possible had the study not uh, gone to the, the lengths of including males and females with and without autism in their study. And what this suggests, with, perhaps with regard to protection or risk, is that whatever developmental mechanisms or drivers are responsible for pushing the brain toward a female-typical neuroanatomy with regard to this one measure, cortical thickness, may also be involved in protection against autism. So just to wrap up now, um, I hope you can feel that, that though the conclusions from these two uh, studies that I shared with you briefly are, are somewhat shallow um, at this current point in time, that it, it really shows that we have still a long way to go to understand um, the details of these mechanisms involved in risk and protection. But still, the data that I've just shared with you, however briefly, um, represent concerted efforts to move into that space, studies that are designed to be able to make headway, to be able to find and identify those aspects of brain biology that are involved in risk and protection. Once we identify those things, then scientists can go in and investigate those mechanisms in detail um, and, and, if appropriate, start to develop therapeutics in that space. Because the goal, as always, is to expand upon our knowledge of autism, to harness that knowledge in a way that will be useful for patients and their families. And, and understanding uh, protection, uh, especially, but also potentially risk in the space, uh, may be a fast track to, to being able to develop such therapeutics and treatments. So with that, thank you for your time, and I will take any questions.